prophetic nights with prophet petrus how to receive the holy spirit and pray yourself out of trouble and into victory we have a lot to cover so hold on we're going to go fast if you miss something you can always just get the video on costly and watch it again is praying in tongues biblical and is it for today that's a good question let's look at some scriptures of praying in tongues because the word of god says by two or three witnesses let every truth be established so if praying in tongues is for today the bible must say so and if praying in tongues is not for today then the bible must prove that so let's look at what the bible says the first witness acts 2 4. now for you don't know don't understand how dispensations work we are living in the new testament from Jesus' birth up until now, we are living in the New Testament. In actual fact, we are living the book of Acts. The book of Acts hasn't stopped. There's nothing that has announced a new dispensation. So we are still living the book of Acts. So let's look. In Acts 2.4, we read that on the day of Pentecost, 120 people gathered in the upper room and all were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not some, every single person that was there. Let's read that Acts 2, 1 to 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound of heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clove tongues that were as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So everybody that was present at the day of Pentecost were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says this is the, the rain. And then the Bible also talks about the latter rain in the last days. So we are now in the last days. This is extra for the Bible scholars that want to go and study some extra out. It's not in the notes. So pay attention if you want to Google it out. At Pentecost, was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They called it the rain. Then the Bible talks in the book of Joel about the latter rain. In other words, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now we are in the end times. We are in the latter days. And so the Holy Spirit is not only something that happened in the book of Acts. It's actually something that continuously happened. And the Bible also says, the latter rain will be greater than the former rain. In other words, more signs, miracles, wonders that we saw in the book of Acts will happen now. Why will we do greater miracles than the apostles or that Jesus did? No, just more in number because there's more Christians that are saved. There were only 12 apostles, 13 if you include Paul, but there's millions of Christians now full of the Holy Spirit. And so the latter rain will be greater than the former rain. Just for the Bible scholars, a little bit extra. The second witness, Cornelius and his household. Acts chapter 10, we find that speaking tongues was the same sign or evidence that convinced the Hebrew Christians who went with Peter to Cornelius' house that the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit. Why is this significant? Up until this point, only Jews were making the conversion to Christianity. And only the Jews that making the conversion to Christianity received the Holy Spirit and could pray in the Holy Spirit. And so the Jews thought it was only for them. But the Holy Spirit gave Peter a vision. And in that vision, he saw things that were unclean. And the Holy Spirit said to him, kill and eat. And he said, no, I will not eat unclean. And then God spoke to him and said, men will come looking for you. You must go to a Cornelius household. Okay. While Peter yet spoke the words, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them who heard the word. What happened? After the vision and the Holy Spirit's instruction, Peter went to Cornelius and he gave them the good news about Jesus Christ. But before he could even invite them to convert, the Holy Spirit already fell on them and they spoke in other tongues. Why did it happen out of order like that? So Peter could understand Christianity and the infilling of the Holy Spirit for everyone, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And they of the circumcision would believe were astonished as many came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak in tongues to magnify God. 
yes, the translation is a little bit funny. We sometimes use the, the King James because it's poetic. Then the third witness, the third witness is in the, uh, uh, um, Acts 19, 1 to 7. We're not going to read all of it because it's very long. But we just look at the main verse, verse 6. When Peter placed his hand on, hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues. So Peter was ministering to the Ephesian disciples. And uh, this was years after the day of Pentecost, proving that the Holy Spirit was not only poured out on the day of Pentecost. This happened years after. And the Bible talks about the latter rain in the end times. We are now living in the end times. When COVID started, we officially started living the book of Revelations. The book of Revelations is the end time. And in Joel, we hear about the latter rain falling in the end times. So praying in tongues started in the book of Acts as the rain. And it continues all the way up to the end times as the latter rain. It will only stop when we leave this earth. When we leave this earth, when the new heaven and earth is made. So, tongues is for today. Don't be deceived. Don't let the devil lie to you. Because it's your greatest artillery. And we'll explain why. So, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's find out who is the Holy Spirit. Well, John 16, 7 says, Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. So, obviously, this is very important if he has to say that. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the counselor will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Many people are sad because Jesus was the perfect man and he did all these miracles and loved all the world. But Jesus was still only one person on the, on the earth. But the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. He's omnipotent. It's all around and over the earth. So the, the helper can help everybody on planet earth at once when Jesus could not. Because he was man. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit him, not it. Many people think the Holy Spirit is a power. Something that you plug into, like a, a light bulb. When you want to light up the light bulb, you plug the light bulb into the socket. You flip the switch and the light bulb comes on. So they think the Holy Spirit is a force or a power. But God calls it him. Even Jesus speaks to him as him, not it. It's a pronoun referring to the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. God the Father is a person. God the Son is the person. God the Holy Spirit is a person. And together they make the triune Godhead. Right. So it's not an it. It's not an it. It has a personality. The Holy Spirit has a personality. And you can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's your helper and your counselor. The Holy Spirit is a gift. So let me just ask you, if I give you a car and a year later I come take back the car, was the car then a gift? No, it wasn't. You don't take back a gift. When you give something a gift, it stays available. I'm setting you up because people say the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues was in the book of Acts, but God gave the Holy Spirit as a gift and it doesn't take gifts back. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is still in operation today because God doesn't give his, take his gifts back. It's not temporary. The Holy Spirit is a gift from God the Father. Jesus said, which of your fathers, if your son asked him for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if you ask for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, in other words, have a sinful nature, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who are asking. So the Holy Spirit is a gift. And it's in operation today. It's not temporary. It didn't die out in the book of Acts. Even in the book of Revelation. Because of Joel. In Joel, Joel 2. Talks about the latter rain. And we know Pentecost was the first rain. So. There's the evidence. The Lord Jesus explains that we do not have to be concerned about receiving a demon when we ask God for the Holy Spirit. But some people think a demon spirit enters you. So many people, when they receive the Holy Spirit, wonder, am I getting a demon? No, you are getting the Holy Spirit, which indwell you. That sounds unusual. Why? Jesus says, if you accept salvation through me, the Father and I come and make a home in you. So Jesus lives inside of us. God lives inside of us. 
The Holy Spirit lives inside of us when we receive him. Why is this then a strange thing? It's not hard to understand. It's not a demon. When did the Holy Spirit come? Acts 1, 8, Jesus said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me and in Jerusalem and the, the, the Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. So when did the Holy Spirit come? At the day of Pentecost. Pente what? <laughs> 50 days after the resurrection of Sunday when Jesus was resurrected. So 50 days after Easter. Yeah. 50 days after Easter is the day of Pentecost. Had fully come. They were in one accord and in one place. And suddenly, like the blowing of a violent wind from heaven, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw that same tongues of fire that separated and come to rest on each of them. Why is that? The tongue of fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Another symbol for the Holy Spirit is a dove. Another symbol of the Holy Spirit is a wind. Is wind. They're all interchangeable. So when you see a dove in the Bible or wind in the Bible or fire in the Bible, that represents or is indicative of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And we receive the Holy Spirit after Jesus' resurrection, 50 days later, on the first day of Pentecost. It was poured out, uh, poured out. Should all believers pray in tongues? This is a very interesting question. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is for all those who believe. And therefore speaking in tongues is the evidence of the Spirit's infilling. And it's also for those who believe. In actual fact, it's for every believer. Acts 2, 38 to 39, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you. Who is he talking to? Unsafe people. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift. So it's not temporary of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's for today. Speaking in tongues is for today. God gave that gift at Pentecost. And God doesn't take back gifts. Otherwise, it's not a gift. So it's not temporary. The gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. And for all who are far off. For all whom love the Lord. Our God will call. Whom the Lord our God will call. So. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Is the evidence. That when you are born again. And you accept Jesus as your savior. For the forgiveness of your sins. Then you must receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's your responsibility. To make sure that you get it. Yeah. Now all of the 120 were filled. Tongues of fire or flames. Came on them. And each of the 120 including Mary, the mother of Jesus, was filled. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There were 120 followers of Jesus in the upper room and all 120 spoken tongues. Why are we hammering this? Holy tongues is not for some and not for others. Mm -hmm. Every believer should be praying in tongues. That's if right. you're not praying in tongues, you should be very concerned. Yeah. We can explain in a little bit how praying in tongues fixes your problems in your life and how the enemy will attack it. For you not to pray or to lie to you to tell you you don't need it. To make you feel uncomfortable. That it feels strange or weird. Because it's your greatest gift. We're going to get to that in a moment. But everyone that was present in the upper room received it. Not some. Everyone. Everybody was included. So the Holy Spirit is for everyone. He's praying in tongues for today. Tongues have been done away with because the Bible says tongues will cease. Uh, this is some arguments that we see uh, periodically. The Bible doesn't say that one day tongues will cease. There's no reference in the present age. There's no reference. So when we get to heaven, there won't be any more mysteries or secrets. And then we won't need to speak in tongues. But on the earth, tongues are for the earth. Tongues will remain. So just to silence some arguments, they say, tongues will cease because the bible says tongues will cease no no it's not referring to the present age mm -hmm. the age where we are living while we are on earth yes. it's talking about the age where the earth is done away with and all of us are either in heaven or actually in hell right do we need to pray in the spirit hmm is it important is the benefit for me am i wasting my time is there no need or is it actually actually super critically important for my walk and life with God. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a story about the revivalist Charles Finley that lived in 1792 to 1875 
and the dear brother Daniel Nash, that was his personal intercessor. Brother Charles Finley was a revivalist. What does that mean? He would go into towns, tell the people to repent, and revival would break out. The whole town will get saved. There would be great miracles. He would walk into a town in a supermarket and people would fall in the aisles under the power of God. He would go to factories and as soon as he enters the factory, people would start shaking and they would repent. Some of them would be miraculously healed. There would be signs and wonders and miracles. And before he could even give the message to come to Christ, people would be repenting. When he went to church, his church sermons were fire. People were supernaturally healed, set free. Uh, uh, People went into the church being an alcoholic. They came out totally set free. The, The stories were incredible. He would not even give the altar call. And people would jump up out of the pew saying, I'm on fire. I can feel I'm burning. And then they would run to the altar and start repenting. It was supernatural. And it had power. The power of God was demonstrated. Many people, countless of people were set free and delivered and healed and fell under the power of God and and had radical encounters with God, even visions and dreams. What is remarkable about Charles Fulton in in his era, the the other revivalists only had a 10% retention rate. What does that mean? Everybody that was reborn or born again or came to Christ under the other revivalists of that day, 90% of those people fell away into the world again. So they got born again. They tried it for a little while. Then they went back to being in the world. They only had a 10% retention rate. So only 10% of the people that were saved under the other revivalists stayed saved. But with Charles Finley, he had an 80% retention rate. That's like eight times more than everybody else. Why is that? And why did he have so much power? And why did people fall under the power of God when he went to visit the town? And why all the miracles and wonders? Well, the key was Father Daniel Nash. Some people say Father Daniel Nash. Some people just say Brother Daniel Nash. He was a very humble man. He didn't care about titles. He was Charles Finley's personal intercessor. Now, what? What are that? He was his personal intercessor. So what he would do, he would hold interviews before Charles Finley went to a new town. And he would interview people who could pray in tongues. And if they met the criteria to fervently pray in tongues, how does that mean? What does that mean? With great gusto, with great effort and enthusiasm. And then he would go to that town, book a room, a week or two before Charles Finley shows up, and they would, morning to night, lay on their face and intercede, pray in tongues for when Charles Finley arrives so that God can show his glory. So how did they pray? How did that sound like? How intense was that? Well, I'll give you this example. The one town... They went to an inn and they booked a room in the inn and they were praying and praying from the morning to the night. They they would do this like for weeks. And the innkeeper said something, it sounds like, I don't know, like they're sick. And she went upstairs and looked through the little slit above the door and she saw them all groaning and rolling on the floor. She thought they were dying. So she contacted uh, Charles Finley and said to him, your people are here in my room upstairs, busy dying. You better come quickly. He said to them, no, they are just interceding for my arrival so that the glory of God can touch the people. Don't interfere. And so they would pray like this for 12 to 18 hours a day, every day for two to three weeks before Charles Finley stepped in. And as that is not evidence enough, Charles Finley passed away. Uh, uh, brother uh, uh, Nash passed away before Charles Finley. You can see that he died in 1831. And in 1831, when he died, nobody was interceding for Charles Finley anymore. And Charles Finley tried to continue his revivalist ministry, but there were no more signs and wonders, people repenting, falling under the fire, people being convicted. The glory of God wasn't shown anymore because Charles Finley himself wasn't praying. 
And so, when the intercession stopped, the glory and the power of God on Charles Finley's ministry stopped. So, I ask you, do you think we need to pray in the Holy Spirit? Well, if you want the power of God and the glory of God and a good outcome, yes, you need to pray. We can clearly see in Charles Finley's ministry, when Brother Nash stopped praying, the glory went away. The power stopped. He even publicly said, the glory has left. I'm no longer a revivalist. And he gave it up before he died. He gave it up after Brother Nash died because the power left, because the intercession left. So do we need to pray in the Holy Spirit? Does prayer make a difference? Absolutely. John Wesley says, it seems God is limited by our prayers that God can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him to. People say to me, but Prophet Petrus, God is all-powerful. That's true, but let's take a look at something very important. God created the earth and he had authority. Then he gave that authority to Adam. Adam unknowingly gave that authority to the devil. Jesus died to reclaim the authority, but he didn't give it back to God. He gave it to the church. So God is limited if you don't pray. You have the authority to exercise your dominion on the earth, and you also have the authority to remove the limits of God and put him in action. That may sound strange, but you need to meditate on that a little bit. You need to pray in tongues to have oil in your lap. Matthew 25, at that time, the kingdom of God of heaven was, will be like 10 virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The Bible is talking about Christians because they were virgins. So these are not five unsaved people and five saved people. These are 10 Christians because that's the symbol for virgin. So Five foolish Christians and five wise Christians. We're going to find out why they were foolish. The foolish ones took their lambs, but did not take any oil with them. Now, let me explain to you. Oil is another symbol for the Holy Spirit. So oil and the dove and, and fire and wind is all interchangeable. All of it represents the Holy Spirit. The wise ones, however, took oil in their jars along with their lambs. The bridegroom was a long time coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, that's the rapture, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the ten virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some oil. Our lamps have gone out. Now they replied, There, there may be not enough for both of us and you, instead, go to those who sell oil and buy from them for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, the supper of the Lamb, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know, know the day or the hour. Now, this is very interesting. There's another occurrence where the Bible talks about the day or the hour. That is the rapture. The rapture. Not going to go into that teaching, but what does this mean? Half of the church was ready because they were praying in the Holy Spirit every day. And the other half was not. And so the half that was ready was caught up in the rapture with Christ. And the other half was left behind. It's not me who's saying it. It's here in the word of God. The virgins who were not ready went. The virgins who were ready went with the banquet. The other virgins went to try to get oil and then come back. So you should be praying in tongues every day. You can't be trying to pray in tongues right at the end and think you're going to make an rapture. It's here in the word of God. You're making a fat mistake. You might be sorely disappointed. So Oil is indicative or a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't pray in the Holy Spirit every day, your lamp doesn't have oil. That's what this uh, parable means. So what happens when we do pray in the Spirit? Enough about making you scared. Let's see all the benefits. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he speaks in the tongue, does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, 
in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. So when we pray in tongues, we are speaking directly to God. It's like that red phone on the president's desk. When somebody with an emergency tries to phone in, they phone using their red phone and go straight to the president's office where he is. This is an important call. I better take it. That's what happens when we pray in tongues. It's our direct line to speak to God and to speak mysteries. Okay, we'll get to that a little bit later. So when we speak in tongues, we are speaking to God. We are the mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For everyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them, but they are the mysteries by the Spirit. So what are these mysteries? 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Although in the Spirit, he is speaking sacred mysteries. So, let's unpack that. What does that mysteries mean? Well, here's the evidence. Pay attention. When we pray in tongues, we pray our destiny into existence. Romans 8, 26, 27 says, in the same way, the Spirit helps in our weakness. Why? Well, do you know what's happening tomorrow? What if a car hits you 10 a.m. on the dot and you're dead on the spot? Mm. That rhymes. I know it's funny. Sorry. Prophetic humor. Would you know that today? Do you know next week maybe that you need a certain sum of money or that one of your relatives may be in danger? Do you know your future? No. No. No, you do not. And so, do you also know what the enemy is planning to attack? What other people are trying to do to you? That is your weakness. You don't know the future. And you don't know how to manipulate or control or, or create a favorable outcome for the future. Because you don't know it. So, we do not know what we ought to pray for. That's what this scripture means. Listen. Praying is not just for the day in the moment when you need something. How do you pray a future attack or calamity away? Or how do you pray the fulfilling of a need or a lack into your existence if it's in the future where you don't know about it? How do you know everything you need and when you need it? You are human. You don't know the future. And so you do not know how you ought to pray. You do not know. Yes, in the, in the Bible. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groanings. Wordless groanings just means your own language, your own tongue that you speak in. Surely they couldn't list them all, so they just said wordless groanings. Okay? So, let me do the B part, and then I'll stitch it together. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the, with the will of God. Okay? So, when we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit is praying God's will into our lives. What is God's will? For us to prosper, for us to not be sick, for us to be overcoming, for us to have peace, for us to have joy, for us to live in victory, for us to be in abundance, for the enemy not to steal, kill, and destroy us. It is for our protection, our health, our well-being, our future, our promotion, the desires that is put in your heart, all the dreams you want, the things you want to be fulfilled. Maybe the next car or the next house, the better house. God doesn't mind you having stuff. In fact, Jesus became poor so you can be rich. And God wants you to have a life of abundance. And he understands that you don't know how to pray because you don't have, you don't know the future. So part of the helper's job is to pray on God's behalf, God's will, into our lives. How amazing is that? Many people come to me and they say, my life is hard. I'm always suffering this lack, uh, uh, not getting the promotion. My car's always breaking. I just hear all the problems. Problems that never stop. It's endless. No promotion, difficult life. God's not blessing them. And when I ask them, do you pray in tongues? The answer is no. No, I'm not getting promoted at work. I'm not getting my husband. Um, uh, I want a wife, I'm 40 years old and I'm still single. And then when I asked him, do you pray in tongues? No, I don't pray in tongues. Well, God's will for your life is not going to happen automatically. God is a good God. He created you because he loves you. And he, his only son died to make everything in heaven available to you. That's a life of abundance, overflow, promotion, peace, joy, 
a good life, a victorious life, not a life where you're suffering, but it's not automatic. We saw that it's not automatic because we don't pray. And so when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you pray your mess of your life into a glorious life. But it doesn't happen any other way. So when we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit is praying God's will into our lives. Whether you are sick or you need emotional healing or you need finances or whatever the trouble is, whatever the situation is, God is praying it through the Holy Spirit, His will into your life. Now, I don't know about you. If you think the world is going to get better, you're making a very big mistake. The Antichrist is about to take the stage. And for him to take the stage, he's destroying law and order because law and order prevents the lawless one from coming. If there is law and order, it's a supernatural force that prevents lawlessness. And so as the Antichrist represents lawlessness, he has to break law and order so that he can take the stage. COVID was a small taste of what is about to come. And I don't want to scare you. The Bible talks about perilous times in the end times. Perilous times will come. War and rumor of war and everything else. We saw that happening with uh, Ukraine. That could have been South Africa. Now, your ticket out and for you to be prosperous and to be financially sustained and to have provision and food and to be well and to overcome is praying God's will into your life through the Holy Spirit. So, hey, should we pray in tongues? And why do we pray in tongues? Well, if you're okay to be succumbed to calamity and attack and to be overwhelmed with lack and all those things, you don't have to pray. But if you do pray, then you will overcome. It will not touch you. God will make supernatural provision because you're praying His will into your life. And so, now than ever before, Christians should be praying in tongues because we are entering perilous times. COVID was only the start. So we are entering perilous times. It's going to get worse. I don't, I'm not a doom and gloom prophet. It's in the Bible. But if you apply what we're teaching you here today and you start praying in tongues and you and, and you conditions and, and the devil will fight you. He'll make all manner of excuses and put interesting things in your way. And then you check, hey, another week went by. I still didn't pray. You have to be militant because the enemy attacks you, mm. attacks you because he knows praying in tongues, your biggest artillery, your biggest weapon. It's, it's for your safety where you, where you get out of the difficult, troubling thing that must over, overcome and overwhelm you unscathed. It's your biggest weapon. So that's the key out. When we pray in tongues, the spirit is a mystery to the world and to the devil, but it's not a mystery to God. And so it's very difficult for the enemy to attack a plan that he doesn't know what the plan is. And so when you are speaking in, in your English language or your natural born language that you were born with, Satan understands the, as, uh, those. Uh, I don't know the scriptural reference. You can Google it if you want, but, but Satan is clever. Satan is clever. And so he, can, he understands all human language. But when you're praying in tongues, you're praying a mystery to God. Now, if I, in English, ask God, Father, give me X, Y, Z, Satan knows what I prayed, and so he can come and attack me. But when you are praying a mystery, it's between you and God. Nobody else knows. Yes. When we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit will reveal to us what we are praying about. Sometimes that happens on the spot. You can pray in tongues and sense you are praying for a brother. You can pray in tongues and sense it's for your promotion for your job. But sometimes it only comes later. And so many people are confused by this. I'm one of them. I pray in tongues and then I move on. And then two, three days later, I get revelation about something. And then I realize, oh, that was the thing I was praying about. God just drops in my spirit and I supernaturally understand everything all at once. So don't be hung up when you pray in tongues and you don't know what you are praying about at the time. At the right time, God will reveal it to you. Sometimes it's for your safety because you can abort it or blab it out or uh, um, destroy it before it ever takes off. But the Holy Spirit will reveal to you. Mm. I get a lot of revelation when I'm not praying. Mm. I say to God, I, uh, I don't need to pray in tongues. I get revelation all the time. And then God said to me, duh, that's yesterday's praying in tongues revelation you're receiving today. Okay? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, okay, I will pray. <laughs> 
We experience supernatural fellowship with the Father while we are praying in tongues. And so many people say they don't feel this. Well, you've got unbelief. You've got unbelief that, the Holy, that you are not fellowshipping with the Father and with the Holy Spirit when you're praying in tongues. Maybe you must find a good scripture that's the antidote. Meditate on that so that it can go in your heart and uproot your unbelief. I was like that. The devil was lying to me. Why is this important? Because praying in tongues strengthens your spirit, man. Mm. But your natural senses and your emotions don't always line up. Yes. And so who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe fact or truth? Fact is, you might feel depressed. Truth is, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Fact is, you may have flu, but the truth is, you've been healed. And so, you must step into truth that you are fellowshipping with God, and your spirit man and your life will reap the benefits. Your spirit is praying. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So what does that mean? When we pray in tongues, our spirit man, our spirit, we call it the heart, but our spirit man is talking to God. The spirit of God is in us, in our spirit. We are praying in tongues. Our spirit and God's spirit interact and they have fellowship. However, however our minds are not participating. Your mind, will, and emotion, the, the soulish, fleshy part, your carnal nature is not engaged. And the devil will make your flesh scream, telling you, this is a lie, it's boring, it's not working, it has no power, it'll never work, work out, you're wasting your time, nothing good can come of this. He, the, the, all the forces of hell will come to attack you. And, and you must make the decision, am I going to stand firm? Am I going to cultivate the discipline to pray in the spirit every day? Or am I just going to sit on the bench and let the devil overwhelm me? You can pray in tongues while you work, while you drive, while you're doing other things because your mind is not participating. Paul does mention that you can pray in tongues and then focus on God and that way let your mind be in tune and then it's even a better experience. That's just a little extra. So your spirit is praying, but your mind is not. And you can help that process by allowing your mind to think of the things of God and focusing on Him and trying to say, what is He saying? Am I receiving anything while you are praying in tongues? But you can work, drive, cook, bake, clean, do whatever while you pray in tongues. And let me just explain to you, you cannot pray in tongues in your mind. That's a shocker. That doesn't exist. God is a speaking spirit. He created the earth and everything we have by speaking. And we are created in God's image. And we create everything we want by our words. Deuteronomy says life and death is in the power of the tongue. So whatever you eat today is what you said yesterday. You cannot pray in tongues in your mind. You have to speak. But you can pray softly under your breath so only you can hear yourself. We are recharged by the Spirit. Now, I want to challenge you. If you say, I pray in tongues, but it does nothing for me, then you take Jude 1. 20 and 1 Corinthians 14 4 and you print them out and you put them on your wall and you also memorize these two scriptures and then you take the prophet Petrus one year scripture challenge many of you know in areas of my life where I didn't have the victory that's what God did to me so what is the one year scripture challenge you say the scripture when you get up in the morning you say it at lunchtime you you read it before you go to bed at night and for one year, you meditate on these two scriptures and you eat them throughout the day. You meditate on it. You think on it. You ponder it. And before the year is out, they will go into your heart and uproot the unbelief. Why you, can, why, why, why you say, I'm not being built up. I'm not being edified. I'm not being strengthened. It's because you have unbelief. And this is the antidote for unbelief. But let's look at how you are recharge spiritually so when you meditate on these scriptures for a year and they become alive in your heart you will be recharged spiritually when you pray in tongues very important jude 120 but you beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith praying in the holy spirit so when we are praying in tongues we're building ourselves up we are recharging 1 corinthians 14 4 he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself 
edify in Greek, okadomeo, meaning to recharge, to build up, to strengthen, to encourage. It also means to refresh. So this is why you pray in tongues. And if you're not getting the benefit of this, when you do pray in tongues, you need to eat these two scriptures for a year. Then your life will be power when you pray in tongues. Amen. It will be power. We are encouraged and empowered. When we pray in tongues, we charge up our spiritual battery. Now, how many of you know your phone doesn't run forever? Mm. It's going to get that point where the red battery light comes on and then it just says, poof, it's dead. And then you must charge it again. We are the same. You have to charge up your spiritual battery. When we are encouraged and emboldened and empowered to do with boldness and courage for the rest of the world. And if you don't feel like you have boldness and courage and uh, recharged, this is your medicine. These two scriptures, you must chew on it, meditate on it for a year. You will never be the same. Okay. We are interceding. Praying in tongues is the Holy Spirit empowerment to intercession romans 8 26 but the holy spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings praying in tongues which cannot be uttered which cannot be expressed in a normal language is what we mean so we know that jesus intercedes for us in heaven we also know that when we pray in tongues the holy spirit intercedes for us on our behalf and remember the holy spirit is omnipotent like god who knows the future the holy spirit also seeks the spirit of god and revealed to our spirit and so we are making intercession or actually we are allowing the holy spirit to make intercession on our behalf when we pray in tongues powerful practical example if danger was coming your way and you didn't know the holy spirit would put a burden on your heart now some people don't understand what a burden is. You may feel uneasy, or you may, you feel I'm having a bad day, or you feel uncomfortable, or sad, or depressed. When you feel it's like that, you must pray in the Holy Spirit. It means danger is coming. But if you have a prayer life where you pray every day, then this will not be a problem. It might not even happen because you prayed the danger away already. Yeah. And many Christians are waiting for a burden only to pray when calamity comes. If you sear your conscience, in other words, like a hot branding iron, you burn it so there's no more nerves. You can't feel anything. So if you don't live a life of prayer, the Holy Spirit is not going to give you a burden to pray. True. Because you've rejected him every day. You have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit where you're praying in tongues every day. Then he will warn you of things to come that you need to pray out with him so that you can intercede. John 16, 13, Jesus said, and he will tell you things to come. Why does he tell us things to come? Because God wants his children to be ready for what's coming so that you are prepared. God loves us, doesn't want us to be in danger. He also doesn't want us to go through the problem. But that's only part of it. He also doesn't want you to miss the promotion yeah. or a good deal or for you to benefit, to, uh, for you to have a dream fulfilled. Tragedy will never come to us without the Holy Spirit of God trying to warn us. And if you're saying, but the Holy Spirit is not warning me, my question to you is, are you praying every day so you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit so that he can warn you? No. Well, then he's not going to warn you. Simple as that. So he tells us things to come, not just bad things, good things too. Hey, did you see this deal? Get ready. You're going to be promoted. Put, put, put in this paper so they can promote you and you can get double your salary. Move to another country. All these things come through John 16, 13, who will tell us things to come. We can birth something when we're praying in tongues. The wonderful Holy Spirit wants to give birth to something beautiful in your life and ministry. They call it travailing. Travailing. Travailing is a deeper form of praying in tongues. A woman giving birth is a good example. The baby is a gift, right? A gift and a blessing and a joy. But when the mother is about to give birth, the, 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 the birth pains come. It's, it's painful and she goes into anguish, crying out in pain. Well, sometimes we pray like that to give birth to something beautiful and new, something marvelous, a wonderful gift. When that happens to you, don't shy away. The Holy Spirit is like a river. 
get into the river and pray. Pray, abandon yourself to prayer. And, and you'll see that it's more fervent. What does fervent mean? It's, it's more serious prayer, more effort, more focused prayer. And you can give birth to uh, maybe a marriage, you're not married, or baby, financial breakthrough, a new ministry, overseas holiday. Uh, you need to pray it out in tongues to give birth to things like this. We've got many amazing testimonies about it, even in our own lives. How to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, maybe many of you are praying in tongues already, and that is great. But we all need to receive the Holy Spirit. And you can receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 44. Peter was still preaching the words. The Holy Spirit fell upon the people who heard the word. So you can receive the Holy Spirit simply by hearing the word. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you can make up your mind and say, this is a free gift, and I'm hungry, and I want it. Amen. I just want to explain Satan likes to prevent Christians from praying because when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you undo his plans. He can't steal, kill, and destroy. Him. So he's very unhappy about that. So one of you, your biggest weapon is praying in tongues. The devil knows that. And so he stops believers. So I'm going to pray right now for everybody who's watching now and for people that will watch this in future in the name of Jesus. I take authority over the devil that's blinding people's minds, that's under the sound of my voice for understanding the importance and confusing them for praying in tongues. Yes. No more confusion and no more influence from the devil. I bind you in the name of Jesus. Yes. Right. It's every believer's gift. And it's a free gift. God will not force you. Just understand that if you don't pray in tongues and you don't believe in praying in tongues, you're not going to have a victorious life of abundance and overflow. And if you expect other people to dig you out of your own pit, that's also quite not what's going to happen because each of us are responsible to partner with God that his will be done in our lives. And so you can't shortcut it by living on crutches and getting other people to bring your miracles from heaven. You are actually responsible for doing that yourself. And if you are on crutches, Expecting other Christians that are mature to always continually bring your gifts from heaven, God will not always give the gift. I'm sorry, but it's true. And so you need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to go in the rapture, you need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And you need to pray in tongues. You need to pray in tongues every day. And so now more than ever, it's for the church and uh, <clears throat> every believer must pray. So the Bible says it's a free gift for everyone. And all you need to do is, first of all, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'm sure you have done it. If you haven't, just say, Father, I come to you. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me all of my sins. He's the Son of God. He's your Son. He died and rose from the dead. And through him is the way to salvation. I'm making right with you today. I'm accepting him as my Savior in Jesus' name. And so, if you've prayed that prayer, you are now a Christian. Amen. Or if you want more time on our platform is, of course, um, Salvation, God's Way, How to Pray everyone, in, Anyone into Heaven, and Are You Going to Heaven Checklist. Those two courses are for you. Do them and then come back to this course. But if you're a Christian already and you want the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's a free gift. All you have to do is say, yes, I want it. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. That's all you have to do. It's not hard. So, how to receive the Holy Spirit? I thank God. He gave me a very unusual approach. Yes. How to explain the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There was a lady in our church while I was doing Bible school. I think it was in third year or second year. She came to me during Bible school break when we were having dinner. And she said to me, um, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I said to her, that's wonderful. Um, I'll help you. And then she said, hmm, Apostle Thea prayed for me. That didn't work. Pastor Mike, the prayer pastor, prayed for me. That didn't work. It's 30 years now that I've been trying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Nobody's ever helped me. So I'm glad that you say you can help me. Boy, oh boy, that I want to run away. I was praying that the earth swallow, uh, open up and swallow me alive. I, uh, I couldn't undo what I, what I had said to her. So I said to her, I will go and pray about it. But I was just actually looking for a pop-out. How am I going to let this lady down? And the whole week, 
I was trying to run away and how am I going to tell her and what am I going to do? And I felt so embarrassed. And then Holy Spirit said to me, but you haven't asked me for the answer. Do you think that I can't tell you how to do it? So in actual fact, you think I can't work through you? And the answer was yes. That's what I was thinking. And so the Holy Spirit explained this to me. I've had 100% success sorry. So if you do this, if you cannot pray in the Holy Spirit and you listen to what I'm going to explain now and you do what I tell you, you will pray in the Holy Spirit. I've got 100% success rate. I've helped many, many people, all the difficult cases. Not because I'm special, just because the Holy Spirit gave me the shortcut. The shortcut. So if you have a dining room table on your left, you see a nice picture of it. That's a beautiful dining room table. Do you think one person can carry that table on its own? No. It needs help. But here's where people get confused. When you pray in tongues, does that mean the Holy Spirit moves your tongue? No, it does not. Does it mean the Holy Spirit moves your mouth and your lips and your vocal cords? No, it doesn't. Shocker. <laughs> You're not a robot. The Holy Spirit is not going to control your mouth and your tongue and your vocal cords and make words come out. Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't work like that. The Holy Spirit is the helper. So what does that look like? The Holy Spirit is also not a slave. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the helper. So if you want the Holy Spirit to help you move that table, the Holy Spirit is not going to stand ready on his side and pick up and wait for you. That's what a slave does. The Holy Spirit goes into action when you go into action. That's what a helper does. So if you go to the table, the Holy Spirit will go to the table too. And if you put your hands on the table, the Holy Spirit will put his hands on the table. And when you lift, the Holy Spirit will lift. That's what a helper is. The Holy Spirit is not there to be bossed around. The Holy Spirit is there to be respected. He's only the helper. And so praying in tongues is like that. And I'll explain to you. But understand that the Holy Spirit is not going to flap your mouth and move your tongue and move your vocal cords. No, that's what demons do. They like to take control. The Holy Spirit is only the helper. So you have to go into action. I'm going to show you how to go into action. Like the Holy Spirit starts lifting the table the moment you start lifting the table. When you go into action, the Holy Spirit helps. I guess the challenge. The devil will tell you it's a lie. And you must make up your mind. Are you prepared to make a fool of yourself for God? Well, that's a good attitude to have. I'd rather be a fool for God and try and fail and look like an idiot than not try at all. I will not let the enemy bully me. And make me feel shy and uncomfortable. Because then I will never pray in tongues. He tried to do that to me. When I started praying in tongues for the first time. I'm sure some of you feel like that. But it's all in your mind. It's the devil just trying to stop you. And so. Let me explain how you go into action. So you have what is called an imagination. And with your imagination you can create. You can create a painting. You can create a book. You can create a story. You can also create words. You can create words. And when you activate your imagination in your brain to imagine a word that you must say, let's talk about a one syllable word like da. The moment you imagine the word, the Holy Spirit lifts with you the other side of the table and inserts his word. And so the word you are actually imagining is what the Holy Spirit gives you. So that's part of the fight. You've won 50% of the battle. Now comes the rest. You then have to have the courage to step out onto the water and say the word that the Holy Spirit has given you. And when you say that word, you must then imagine the next word. Re. And then speak it. Sha. And now we're already praying in tongues. And then you can start going a little bit faster and you'll see like it's a river. So for those of you who are ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a free gift. I'm going to pray with you. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit under the sound of my voice. Say this simple prayer. It's very easy. Switch your brain off. Your brain will not understand it. It's a supernatural thing. Say, Father's, Father God. Father God. I receive, I receive 
the infilling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit with the evidence, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, of speaking in tongues, and Satan, and Satan, I bind you, I bind you from interfering, from interfering with this process, with this process in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Congratulations, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to put it into action. Now, in your imagination, imagine a one-syllable word. And now you have the courage to say it. Da. Now imagine the second word. Re. And the one after that. Sho. Now let's build a little bit of momentum and keep going. Ba. Do. Ma. Khe. Ki. Ro. Sha. And now let's pray a little bit faster. Doro pa shakata leri bi ben diran di aho porishiash mashashia lerde. O brosh boleri bi bambi ardi en de hikiki karguar das tastia mui. Congratulations, you've spoken in tongues. Amen. Practice it. Practice makes perfect. You might be struggling because you've never done it before, and the devil will bully you. But if you are disciplined, and you persevere, it's like a river, and it's like a bicycle, the wind will take you, the Holy Spirit is helping you, Amen. and congratulations, go write this date, and and time down, it's a red letter day for you, you've received the Holy Spirit, you're praying in tongues, we praise God for you, Amen. now that you are praying in tongues, what do you do? God gave me this rule when I was a baby Christian, and you can do more but never less. And so let me explain to you the 2020-25. You will also see this in my fasting workshops. In actual fact, I teach this in everything I do, wherever I get an opportunity. It's had tremendous benefit for me. Okay? God told me I must read the Bible out loud for 20 minutes. The New Testament. And if I get to the end of the New Testament in a month or two, I must just start again from the beginning of the New Testament and carry on doing that. 20 minutes every day out loud. Why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Science proves if you read in your mind without saying it out loud, you use 10% of your brain. And science also proves when you read something out loud, you are engaging your brain 100%. So it's 10 times more effective. In other words, if you read the Bible every morning for 20 minutes in your head, it will take 10 years to get the same result as to praying it out loud. Praying the Bible out loud in one year gives you the same results as praying it for 10 years, the same amount of faith and effect in your life. The Bible also says you must meditate on Scripture so it can go into your heart because when Scripture goes from your head, which just knowledge into your heart, which becomes truth, then you unlock it by faith. It becomes real for you. And so if you just read the scripture, it stays head knowledge for a lot longer because you're not meditating on it. So I love shortcuts. God knows this. And the 20, the first 20, reading the word out loud to yourself is a shortcut. It's also a faith injection. Your faith leaks. Many might not know it. Think of a bucket with a couple of holes. If you fill it with water and you carry that bucket, by the end of the day, all the water would have leaked out of the hole. Your faith is the same. You can't build up on faith today and 10 years from now you have the same faith. Your faith leaks. And so when you read the word out loud, because the word of God says faith comes by hearing the word of God. When you read the word out loud and your brain is 100% engaged and you are focused and meditated, you are getting a faith injection, a booster shot. Then the next 20 is pray in tongues for 20 minutes. Now people reverse the order. You should not do that because you pray in tongues by faith. You pray in tongues by faith. Without faith, you cannot pray in tongues. And so as you've just had a faith injection, your praying in tongues then is more effective than if you do it the other way around. Does that make sense? You've just had your booster shot, your faith booster shot. So then praying in tongues is more effective. 
you're going to get more in that 20 minutes than if you prayed five hours before you read the Bible. Because you've just had an injection of faith. And that's why you read the word first for 20 minutes. Then you pray in tongues for 20 minutes. Then for 20 minutes, sing in tongues. Sing in tongues. To help, you can pr uh, play some Christian music in the background. And whenever they use English words, then you sing your own words. Sing your own words. It takes a little bit of practice, but the Holy Spirit will help you. When you're done praying in tongues, five minutes quiet time with God. But before I just get there, I, I just want to tell you, praying in tongues and singing in tongues are not the same. Singing in tongues is more powerful than praying in tongues. Why? Because when you praise and worship God, He goes into action on your behalf. God steps in and starts fighting for you. And so there's a natural progression. Read the word for 20 minutes, get your booster shot of faith, pray in tongues, mysteries are being revealed to you and you're edifying yourself. 20 minutes, sing in tongues, start worshiping God and God goes into action and moves on your behalf. And then five minutes quiet time with God. Just sit and wait for him for five minutes. The Bible says God came to visit Adam in the cool of the day. In the Mediterranean area, the cool of the day never lasted long. So we, we are so super spiritual. Now I must wait. An hour, uh, I must have an hour quiet time with God. Uh, I must wait for him. And No. Just five minutes. Give him five minutes. I want to explain the 20, 20, 20. This part is not quiet time with God. This part is for you. So you can't say, oh, I had an hour with God. I feel fantastic. No. Five minutes quiet time. You know, married men will understand when you're sitting in front of the TV, you're not spending quiet time with your wife. You're spending time with the TV. And so when you want quiet time with the wife, you say five minutes alone. It's just me and you. So five minutes where you put your phone down and you're not going to, well, actually your phone should, be not, should not be, pre nothing must be present. Yeah. No Facebook, no WhatsApp. No, no. It's you and God. Read the word, pray in tongues, sing in tongues, and then five minutes quiet time with God. And God will test you. Most of the time, you'll feel nothing. In that five minutes, you'll just observe. And sometimes he'll visit you and you'll have amazing time. And, and, and sometimes you'll feel God is not here, but he's watching you. You just give God five minutes. You do this for one year. And you tell me it doesn't work. It's not needed. I'm still waiting for somebody to come to tell me I've done it for a year and it's not working. Everybody says, I should have done this long ago. And so now that you pray in tongues, do the 20, 20, 25, and you understand what that means. You can pray more. This is not, uh, um, this is the minimum. Mm. The minimum that you must do every day. The minimum. Pray in, uh, read the word, get your faith booster shot, then pray in tongues on that booster shot, sing in tongues on that booster shot, have five minutes quiet time with that booster shot. This is the most optimum effective shortcut there is. Yes. Because God knows I love shortcuts. So he, he told me this. When he gave it to me, he didn't explain it to me in the beginning. Only 10 years later, they say, okay, you've been doing the 20, 20, 25. Do you, would you like to know what it means <laughs> and, and why? And then I was astounded. And God is right. When I don't read the word, my prayer is not as effective. And so now that you pray in tongues, make this part of your day. You have to be militant and disciplined because, listen, Satan will try to stop you. He will try to stop you because when you pray, he loses power over you. Your life becomes so crazy good, you don't know what to do with yourself. And so the devil's going to try and stop you. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy that goes sit on the bench after you've received praying in tongues. God is waiting for you to make your life so crazy good to fulfill your dreams that you don't even know what to do with yourself. And Am I going to even check this? It's definitely for you. Watch it periodically. It will bless you. So we've reached the end of how to receive the Holy Spirit and to pray yourself out of trouble into victory. We trust that you, will be, uh, you were blessed. Um, take care and stay tuned for the next episode.